Let's put together a ultrasonic mist generator unit with four heads and this one is different from the other ones and it doesn't have any fancy features it's simply you apply power and it turns on and that is it no buttons or anything. So this came from Aliexpress it wasn't that expensive but the price seems to fluctuate up and down it seems to vary between about £1.50 to about £5 depending on when you buy it. So the construction of this is as follows. You have the support for the wicks and you put a spring into it. Let me zoom down this so you can see this better. So you put a little spring down. I put the big end down and then you can shove that in with one of the wicks. And the idea of that is that once it's in position, it applies a bit of pressure against the wick to keep it up against the ultrasonic disc. When you've done that, you can place the ultrasonic disc into the support that that goes onto. So this is effectively going into here and just pressing on and there's the spring loaded uh, wick and the ultrasonic discs have a domed surface and I reckon I should test this we'll find out if it works that it's the ver side that points down the way that actually makes contact the wick as opposed to side that's further away from it which can would kind of make sense and there is a little hole in this for actually putting the cable out so this goes in like this uh, the wires go in there, and then when this cover goes on, there is a little indent, a little slot in it here, that lines up with that, and this should just click in, theoretically. Kind of. Hmm. I shall lever it in the screwdriver, partly to avoid huge microphone noises. Okay, so that's it clicked in. Lovely. And that way... When this is uh, in use and it's got the spring, it's basically just going to be feeding liquid up to that. And this now presses into here. So now, oh, hold on. Where's the, how does the, is there a gap for the wire? I don't think there is. I think it just makes, makes it so that you don't, oh no, that is going to push against that. Oh, this wire must go through to the top then. Hold on. I shall feed this through. Is this going to be better? Yes, it is. Okay, so the wires are on the top. This is useful to know. Right, I shall put the rest of this together, and then we can test it. One moment, please. Okay, that does appear to be working now. I have assembled it together, put it into a mug of water. I shall plug it into this USB supply. This is where just water sprays everywhere, because it does put out quite a lot. I don't know how visible this is going to be, but... Yeah, you can see the jets. If I get a bit of black card, this is making the place very damp. Yes, very, very damp indeed. If I get a bit of black card, you'll see the four jets of fog coming out of that. It's quite impressive. Okay, now we've seen it working. Let's take it apart and we'll reverse engineer the circuit board. So I shall do that right now. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. So we'll get down closer to this. Maybe a bit too close. No, it doesn't really matter. You know, we can get quite close because ultimately it's the same circuit repeated over and over again. So we can concentrate over on this area. I have completely removed one of the inductors. I took all the connectors off this board so I could put it in a hot plate and then use uh, the hot plate to melt the solder so I could get an inductor off and unwind it. It has been unwound. That's not going back together again soon, but we have a lot more data as a result of that. Let's take a good look at the circuitry here. Here's the incoming USB-C port, noting that it doesn't have the programming resistors that tell a smart power supply that it is a load, so without those resistors it won't work with modern power supplies, but it'll work with old-fashioned ones. The current it draws is 600 milliamps. The first thing it hits is a uh, decoupling capacitor just to, for stability of the whole circuit with an option to put a second one in but there's also another one right up next close to the microcontroller the microcontroller has control over an LED um, which I've drawn them in the wrong order in the schematic but not to worry, it doesn't matter it's a LED in series with a resistor and the interesting bit we're, we're looking for here um, this inductor is actually the little transformer the A2SHB MOSFET down here is controlled from the output pin of the chip and it does so via capacitor I'll show you that in the schematic and it's got a pull down resistor but when it does so it actually 
pulls this coil here 24 turns down to the uh, zero volt rail and induces a higher voltage in this 150 turn coil which is connected across the output here and that's what drives the piezoelectric disc and makes it distort. Let's take a look at the schematic. Right, I think I'll just zoom out just a little bit. That'll do. So here is the zero volt rail. That's plus five volts. And this is zero volts. There's the incoming supply capacitor, the one we've got an option of two. There's the decoupler capacitor, just the microcontroller. There is the LED. It's actually the resistor that's connected to positive and the LED is connected to the microcontroller, but it doesn't matter. It's just, uh, it will light regardless. And an interesting thing is that it's not just driving the gate of the MOSFET directly, it's doing so via a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And the reason it's doing that is because if something was to go wrong with the microcontroller and it was to jam the output high continuously, it would uh, cause problems with this uh, MOSFET just shunting this very small number of turns across the 5 volt supply and it would cause things to burn out or draw high current. So by using 100 nanofarad capacitor in series, it can pulse the gate of this MOSFET, but it can't jam it on continuously. That's quite a nice feature. I've done that for audio uh, outputs on game controllers in the past. There's a 100k pull-down resistor, which is unusually high, but that's fine. Um, the windings, the wire diameter is 0.15 millimeter diameter, which correlates to 35 AWG, American wire gauge. There's 24 turns on the primary, which is 270 millimeters total, and uh, 150 turns in the secondary, which is 2.3 meters or 2,300 millimeters total. And that then goes to the piezoelectric disc. The piezoelectric disc is based on a material with a charge on it. And when you apply a voltage across that, it causes it to distort. It's very small physical distortion, but it's enough in this case to smack a stainless steel disc with perforated holes in it up and down on top of that uh, wick and basically just shatter the water into tiny little ultrasonically atomized droplets that spear it as a haze. Uh, this whole circuit from the output here is repeated four times, but there's four separate outputs that might be one of two reasons. It could be to maximize the output current so this uh, MOSFET turns on and off very quickly, which is very important. But it could also be that they're alternating pairs or maybe even just chasing the sequence to pulse the MOSFETs so that the current is spread out across all four of the atomizers and it's not just seeing the current just going full whack and then to zero each time. So I'd guess it is alternating them. That's just a guess though. What's interesting about the circuit board is that the, I wondered, there are four connections on the inductor. There's one at either side and then, well, there's one in the four sides, but the two middle ones are common together with this track that is not just common to the um, positive supply, effectively here, but uh, also goes at commons to the two windings and the MOSFET. Well, the positive is to there. The, this end here is pulled down by that uh, central track to the uh, zero volt rail. And uh, it's common to both these windings. But that is it. Very interesting. Incidentally, just for the novelty factor of it, or the interesting aspect, one of the pioneers of piezoelectric crystals was Pierre Curie and his brother Jacques, or Jacques. Um, and uh, Pierre Curie was Marie Curie's husband. She's the pioneer in researching radioactive materials. But there we have it. Um, the little atomizer, it's not that expensive. I shall provide a link to it should you need one. But uh, it's quite interesting just to analyse it and see how they've wound the transformers and step that voltage up to get the maximum deflection of the piezoelectric disc. Very interesting indeed.